Motherboards, ah. <laughs> MSI has released a slew of Ryzen motherboards. This is the X370 SLI Plus, the value-oriented X370 chipset. Now, if you're not familiar, the X370 chipset on Ryzen uh, is the only one that's designed with uh, NVIDIA SLI in mind, meaning that you can run two graphics cards. Unlike the B350 chipset, it supports running the PCI Express by 16 interface from the Ryzen CPU at by 8 by 8. Now, if you're looking at running an APU or an Athlon A series or something like that on this motherboard, the Athlon CPUs only have a by 8 interface for the GPU, so it's going to be by 8 by 0. But those aren't out yet, so we can't really talk about those yet, I guess. Before we get into the features, let's do a quick physical tour of the motherboard. So at the top edge of the motherboard, we of course have our 8-pin CPU power connector. And then over next to the DIMMs, we've got our CPU fan connector. We've got four DDR4 DIMM slots. This does support DDR4 3200. If you're using two sticks with my Samsung BDI memory, I was able to achieve 3200. Uh, we also have this Kingston kit, which will run at 2933 or 3200. There are two XMP profiles for this memory in UEFI. This Kingston HyperX Predator memory, I was able to get to run at 2933, but I was not able to get it to run at 3200. Then at the front edge of the motherboard, we've got a pump fan one, system fan three, 24 pin ATX power connector, another fan connector. And then we've got a right angle USB 3.0, that's USB 3.1 Gen 1 connector. Then we've got our six SATA six gigabit per second ports. At the bottom edge of the motherboard, we've got our front panel connector, another USB 3.0 or USB 3.1 Gen 1 front panel connector, two USB 2.0 header connectors. Then we've got our LPT1. So yes, you can run a parallel port line printer, although you'll have to get a cable. We've got our RS-232 serial port header. Again, you'll have to get a header. Our LED connector, because we cannot escape RGB LEDs. It's cool, it's cool, it's fine. And then we've got our system fan two connector. And then right next to that, we've got our front panel audio, which is on an isolated part of the printed circuit board. Now in terms of board layout, we've got one PCI Express by one slot at the top, which is great if you're gonna use an oversized air cooler, which I would recommend if you're gonna use Ryzen, but you're gonna overclock the crap out of it because hey, overclocking the crap out of it's fun. Then below that, we've got our GPU PCI Express by 16 slot. Then below that, we've got our M.2. Now I think this M.2 placement is a bit unfortunate because if you run you know, a, a really heat generating M.2 like the Toshiba RD400, not that that's a bad thing, it's just that it might not get the cooling that it needs through really long write cycles. Then just below the M.2, there's another PCI Express by one slot. So that's great if you're gonna run, you know, a triple hot graphics card. If you're running a triple hot graphics card, you've got enough room and you still have your other PCI Express by 16 slot free for another peripheral or another graphics card or whatever. Then you've got another PCI Express by one connector and your PCI Express by four connector through the PCH. Now this is a PCI Express 2.0 uh, PCI Express by four connector, the very bottom one, but you can run, you know, PCI Express NVMe from that or, you know, a capture card or some other peripheral like that. Actually, if, if you're using a capture card like the Black Magic, you know, 4.0, those things are kind of squirrely with PCI Express 3.0 anyway. It, it generally works better to run them with PCI Express 2.0, so that's actually kind of a handy thing. Now, a quick note about RAM placement with Ryzen. Ryzen likes for you to populate the A2 and B2 slots first, which generally are the slots. Uh, it's the slot furthest from the CPU and then you skip one and then the very next slot. On Intel, it's usually the slots closer to the CPU. It depends on the motherboard layout. So on this particular motherboard with the labeling in the manual, that's DIMM B2 and DIMM A2. Now in terms of memory support, Ryzen, the platform, supports ECC. However, the manual states that uh, ECC is, is not supported um, on this particular model. I suspect that a UEFI update or something like that might enable ECC support, but so far as yet, not so much. It's also true that Ryzen, the platform, will run all of the memory slower if you have to have four sticks of memory. So if you're gonna go for 32 gigs of RAM, I would recommend dual rank 16 gig sticks of RAM versus four eight gig sticks of RAM because you'll be able to run the dual ranked memory faster than you can run four single ranked eight gig sticks of memory. Just keep that in mind. Now in terms of Crossfire support, it does support three-way Crossfire. Just keep in mind that your third card in Crossfire is gonna be running through that PCI Express 2.0 by four connection, which is through the PCH. Let's take a look at the back panel. Now at the back panel, we've got our combo PS2 mouse and keyboard port, which is great for people like me that are rocking a Model M. We've got two USB 2.0 ports, DVI and HDMI. Those are for CPUs that have built-in DVI and HDMI. We've got USB 3.1 Gen 1 and another two USB 3.1 Gen 1 below our Realtek gigabit ethernet adapter. Then we've got our As Media USB 3.1 Gen 2 10 gigabit per second ports. And then we've got our Realtek ALC 892 codec 
that's providing our six stereo uh, input outputs for, for our sound card, depending on if we want to run surround sound or, or whatever we want to do like that. The audio solution is 7.1 channel um, HD audio and it is based on the Realtek 892 codec. Now if you are going to run a lot of peripherals with this motherboard, I would suggest that you check out the manual because there's a handy PCI Express bandwidth table in there that shows you how much bandwidth each device is going to have depending on you know, what you're running. Uh, basically the PCI Express by one slots are through the PCH and share bandwidth with the bottom PCI Express by four connector. So if you were going to run something in the bottom slot of PCI Express by four, you know, you're not going to be able to use your, your PCI Express one slots um, necessarily to be able to do something. So you, you need to keep that in mind. But there's a handy table in the manual if you're if you're ever curious about that. Let's talk about what's inside the box. We get a manual, of course, and a driver CD. Does anybody ever use anything from the driver CD? Usually you should just go directly to the motherboard, download your UEFI updates, download the BIOS, you know, download everything, like literally everything you should get directly from the manufacturer's website on day one. Don't skip updating your UEFI, especially on Ryzen. Ryzen needs UEFI updates out the gate, just like Z170, just like Z270, just like every motherboard for the last three or four generations. I mean, it might work out of the box, but don't, you know, don't fly too close to the sun, Icarus. It's like, oh, it's working, it's completely fine. Update your UEFI, trust me. Inside the box, we've got our back panel I.O. connector, two packages of SATA cables, so that's a total of four SATA six gigabit per second ports, manual, and a notice about installing the memory modules like I was talking about before, and that's pretty much it. Notably absent from the box is any kind of SLI bridge or high-speed bridge. If you do plan to run some kind of SLI with this motherboard, you will have to get a high-speed bridge separately. But, you know, with game support for SLI, basically, dwindling, I mean, it's, it's probably a good move to save you a few bucks and not include the high-speed bridge because I've got a drawer of high-speed bridges and I just don't know what I will do with those. Maybe I can make a sculpture out of them or something. Well, how about Linux support? Okay, so the IOMMU situation on this motherboard is exactly the same as every other X370 motherboard that I've looked at so far. Basically, you're going to need the ACS patch, and even with the ACS patch, it's not going to be super awesomely perfectly stable in every single scenario. I can report it is being worked on and it does have attention of very smart people that will be able to fix it, I think, at least I hope, um, at a hardware level or can fix it in, with a software update which kind of sort of patches the hardware, we will see. But other than that, the Linux support was pretty good. There is one caveat and that is you may need to blacklist the AMD GPIO driver with kernel 4.10 and up. Kernel 4.10 adds some support for Ryzen, but like with the new version of Ubuntu, for example, uh, you may need to blacklist the AMD GPIO driver, especially if you're getting like AMD GPIO IRQ timeouts or anything like that. And that's really just some weirdness on the platform. And not everybody's getting it for some reason. There were some people I was helping out on the forum um, the other day and uh, they sent me some stuff uh, as a diagnosis from their system. And I wasn't really able to figure it out beyond there's something squirrely going on with the, uh, the AMD GPIO stuff. It looks like there have been some patches for kernel 4.11, so maybe kernel 4.11 will fix that. But until then, you can just blacklist the AMD GPIO drivers and probably be fine. Other than that, the M.2 worked. Again, IOMMU group zero, but the M.2 worked. Um, you could add a graphics card to the PCH. And as long as your graphics card supports uh, UEFI reinitialization, um, your best bet with IOMMU, honestly, is to put a graphics card in the PCH, boot, which is going to boot off the PCI Express non-PCH graphics card, but at boot time, uh, blacklist or set a stub for the PCI Express by 16 graphics card and have Linux in the console and everything run off the PCH graphics card, because then the add-in graphics card that's in the by 16 slot uh, will be an IOMMU group 2 and that is gonna be your best bet for compatibility and stability and things like that. And if you're absolutely in a hurry, super impatient, you can totally do that with the platform. For our testing, we were using a Kingston HyperX Predator and the Thermaltake Contact Silent 12. Uh, we did overclock Ryzen to 4.1 gigahertz. The board had no problem delivering 4.1 gigahertz. If the Realtek audio codec and the Realtek LAN are a turnoff for you, then you should check out the X370 Gaming Pro Carbon, which has an Intel gigabit adapter on the board. Yeah, it's gonna be a little bit more expensive. This is, like I said, a value-oriented X370 board. This is a great choice if you're gonna run multiple high bandwidth PCI Express peripherals. You know, something, your graphics card at PCI Express by eight, and something else at PCI Express by eight, you know, SCSI controller or, you know, 10 gigabit ethernet or something like that. Um, it's a good choice, but if you're going to run higher end components like that, then you probably want to opt for the 
Intel gigabit ethernet adapter, if nothing else. So stay tuned for my review on the X370 Gaming Pro Carbon because we will look at both. Now the PCI Express slots are reinforced, so if you've got heavier graphics cards or, or large graphics cards, uh, they are metal reinforced, so it'll take a little bit more punishment if you move your machine around for LAN parties or you move your machine around for work or something like that. Well, that's pretty much it for the X370 SLI Plus. If I missed anything, let me know. Uh, if you picked up one of these, let us know what your experiences are in the forums at Level 1 Tech so everybody can be aware. If you're thinking about buying one of these and you've got questions, join us in the forum at Level 1 Tech. I'm Wendell, I'm signing out, and I'll see you later.